you. Well, we've been looking forward to your stage productions as as always, actually. And uh, can you describe to us briefly what this particular show is going to be about? Uh, yeah, I can. It's two halves, and the first half is um, some of my old songs, and that runs about an hour. And um, I'm using some of the old uh, animation from past shows, from old Floyd shows, for a number of tunes. Um, and then the second half is a visual presentation of the President's Pitch Hacking, which also I think runs about an hour. So now uh, the look of this particular show then is based more on film in images than uh, the stage set that you used with the wall? Um, well, there's no wall, but there there is a set in there are a series of flats with false perspectives built into them that come in in front of the uh, screen to create the illusion that one, that we're, that the audience is party to the bedroom within which the piece takes place. The present goes hitchhiking and doing that. In the first half, um, the movie is all uh, anybody that, who's ever been to a Floyd show will remember. There's a sort of circular screen format that we used to use for the last 10 years or so. And so um, all the material in the first half is, is projected using that format. Now, do you feel that you're creating a visual type of counterpoint with all the different images uh, being on the three screens at one time? Can you say that? <coughs> a visual counterpoint? What, amongst themselves, or yeah. uh, at, at certain points, yeah, absolutely. Some of the stuff that Nick Rogue shot in uh, Death Valley and in Oregon um, is cut so that it's so that there's a strange dreamlike quality with the way that the screens work with each other, like that. Who made the, the Napoleon film with three screen screens, in black and white? I don't remember either. Mm -hmm. but that was back in the thirties, I think. Do you find that that process, the counterpoint of the visual process, is similar to a musical process? I think it all works together. And, you know, all the different elements within the show all, it only become satisfying when they all work together. Um, which is why the thing is so difficult to do, because it depends to, to a fairly large extent upon maintaining sync. And maintaining sync in such a way that, that the musicians on the stage feel comfortable enough to be able to play their instruments, even under their constant threat that at any minute it's all going to go crazy. Did you sort of yeah, like well, we're working through that now. We've done three shows so far, right, and we've got through them all. We lost one projector in Rotterdam for about ten minutes. But in Stockholm we went from top to bottom. And it was great. Uh, people know uh, Gerald Scarf, or Scarfe, this is. Scarf. It is Scarf. Yeah, it's yeah, primarily... In a way, I prefer Scarfe. Scarfe. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds nice. Gerald or Scarfe. But uh, they know Scarf's work primarily from the album covers and also the animation that he did with the wall. Now, how is he translating your images visually under the screen? Uh, I think you really have to look at it. You know, you, you, it's silly for me to start giving you verbal descriptions of pictures. You, you need to see them, really, otherwise I don't think I can really convey very much. I mean, there are backgrounds, there are pictures of, you know, crypt steel works, there's all kinds of things, but there's a, there's a whole scene where the central character takes on the persona of a, straight, of a, of a dog, the, 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 um, the song about going to live in the country in the States is all based upon a, a, a dog character called Reg, but you, you're none the wiser. Did you see it? Mm -hmm. You also have used the same set designers, right? Since yeah. uh, you've used since the Animals Tour. Yeah. Why do you enjoy working with them? Um, well, they're very, very good at their jobs. And also, they're, um, it's, 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 a, it's a mutual thing. They like being given these ludicrous problems to solve. You know? I think they enjoy the fact that I take risks. And it makes their business risky as well, because suddenly they're faced with, well, how do you get scenery in and out, you know, in 10 seconds to cover an area that's 100 feet by 45 feet silently? 
where you have no room above the stage. In a normal theatre, you just build flats, right? And you have masses of room above the stage so that you can drop stuff in behind the proscenium, and it just flies out into this huge space. Well, we don't have any space. It's, been, it's very hard, in fact, to find auditoriums that have the necessary... We have to have 60 feet from the floor to the ceiling to fit the show into it. So there are all kinds of technical problems which they really love to solve. But having, having said that, they're not just... This is Mark Fisher and Jonathan Park. They're not just technical. They, the buzz for them is the fact that when they've solved the technical problems, they can sit there and, you know, and be moved by it all. We all go through a process where eventually, because it's all... In the design and planning stage, nobody has nobody knows knows what it's going to look like. It's a real act of faith, you know. But nobody has seen all the film together until we get three projectors running in a big in a large auditorium. When that happens and we run the tape with it, we all sit there in our chairs, trembling slightly, and throw some loud music out and look at the thing. And you know, if you get the chill up the spine the first time you do it, look at it. Then you know you've cracked it. And if you don't, you know you've got to go on working on it. Do something else. Do you come to them with... Uh, that's good. Is there anywhere to go? Good... No, 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 no. Okay. Sorry, all right. And... Yeah. Um, okay, what I was going to ask you, um, when you come to the set designers, do you come to them with a specific idea you know, that's written down on paper or designed, or, or you just throw out, uh, you know, a mental idea to them, or you have them listen to the music? How do you do that? Um, no, I, uh, Mark and Jonathan, I brought them in, played them the album, and then I showed them drawings. Sketches. I do sketches. You know, just in an exercise. But I, t I tend to keep a book, and when I have, start having ideas about a show, I write them down and, and I do sketches. In fact, in my, in my sketches, um, it's a television set that, that is in the bedroom that all the, that this story takes place in was, is actually three-dimensional. So the clever thing that they did was say, well, you know, this is not going to be easy, because the television set's sort of 45 feet by 30 feet, by, well, how are we going to build it? You know? And so, so what they did um, was to say, how about if we try and create a sense of three dimensions whilst working with flats, which we can store on rollers, and because you can't, what you've drawn, you can never track it round. I and mean, look great, but you'd never get it round the cities. So that's that's their job is to take it from there. And then there's a window in in, in it, which I my window was in a different place. They reorganised my sketches to work much better than I could ever have done. How much involvement do you have with the actual designing of the sets? Oh, the actual drawing board work? None at all. But I mean, what, what they then would come back with some drawings and say, look, we think it might work like that. And then, then in the first set of drawings they bring back to me, they had like a, an idea where the screens were separate. There was like a screen here and screens on either side that came down separately out of boxes in the ceiling. And there were other screens in front, you know. So they, they came with an idea of multiple screens. And it took a number of meetings back and forth before we realized that we had to rationalize it down to it being one big screen. And we had to create the illusion of depth by the way that we made the film and the way that we used the scenery in front of the screen. So it's a, you know, it's a whole process. It's like any, it's like any other kind of theatre. It's a process of meetings and thrashing things out. And then, you know, the trick is to sort of half close your eyes and look at a, look at a drawing and really imagine what it, what it might look like in an auditorium. Do you find it difficult to trust work to other people? Um, not to them. Some people I do, yeah. Some, some people. I mean, the film stuff, for instance, obviously an editor has to do an awful lot of the work, but so... And I didn't shoot any of the film myself, but I'm, I, did, I would go... Nick Thompson, who's the film editor, I would go every... I say, as soon as you've done something, you ring me up, and then I go down and look at it. Then we change it all, or change some of it, or start again or scrap it or say, oh, Christ, how are we going to make this work? Or whatever it is, you know, and you go on and on until until it's, it's done. And it's not done now, because this is only the third show. So every day I'm having meetings and we're improving and improving. I think by the time we get to New York, it'll be done. I think it'll be finished, because we've got another three weeks or something. Yeah, that's actually what I was going to ask you about. Uh, how has the, <clears throat> the show changed once it's gotten on stage? 
Well, um, uh, very little as yet, but the stuff is in the pipeline. You know, when you're working with film, you can't just go, oh, we'll change that and it changes. Uh, if you've got to reshoot something, as I'm sure you know, you have to reshoot it and then, and then it has to get in the labs, then you have to get an answer print back and then you have to go back to the cutting copy and work out where you're going to slot it in and then you have to look at the recut that you've made. Then you have to think in terms of recutting the negative, if that's possible, and, and so on and so forth. It's a very long process. And so the changes that, were, um, that we decided to make after... Um, Stockholm, we won't actually get until Birmingham, which is in another three or four days' time. And also, um, has your show differed from night to night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In what ways? Um, well, uh, each night a different percentage of all the technical things go right, you know. Um, eventually, I hope, as with the war, I hope that eventually everything will go right every night. The machine will start to work. And also, of course, um, the, the musicians play differently every night, you know, from night to night. We're all different. Now, this is actually going to be your first so a solo show tonight yeah. in London. Uh, do you feel a little bit nervous playing for this audience? No. I will by five to eight, but it's only quarter past seven now. I've got another 40 minutes before I start really going to pieces. Are they particularly critical here? Fine. Um, no, I th no, I don't think the audience are. I think they'll be. I think they'll be right there. The, the English press are unbelievably. They're really savage, city people. Yeah. Now I, I'd like to get back a little bit to the music itself. The live musicians in your band are playing with pre-recorded. There are no. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Pardon me. I was going to say there are no dead musicians in the band. <laughs> no dead musicians. They're only live. Anyway. Um, does that go on for the whole show, them playing with uh, the track in their hand? Uh, no. No, they play... Um, w wherever we have film that has to be in sync, we have to play to a click track, right? We have a sympty code coming off the dubbing head of the projector, and that drives a 24-track tape, which gives us click and sound effects and the things that have click and sound effects. And then we have to play to a click. In the first half, there are three tunes like that, I think, out of eight, something like that. Three or four out of eight. The second half is all done to click, except for two tunes. The, the uh, Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking, the title track, we do free of click, and we do Sexual Revolution free of click as well. But everything else is done to click, because everything else is married to picture. Was that a challenge for everybody to get used to doing that, or, or was it just, you know, like nothing? Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's a very difficult discipline to work with. The, the real challenge, actually, was getting through the first gig in Stockholm three days ago, because we, we were supposed to be rehearsing for a week with the projectors in England, and the projectors never worked for the entire week. So for that whole week, I was getting tenser and tenser and paying less and less attention to the band as I raved and ranted around the building, screaming at people. And so we, by the time we actually got out on the road, we were pretty fragmented. And we had no idea whether anything was going to work. But the, that first night was just an amazing revelation. Everybody just went... Because <laughs> they're all brilliant. They're all wonderful musicians, and they all just snapped into, you know, top gear and it all happened. It was great. Do you produce the tapes yourself? Yes. And what sort of reaction do you expect when you take this tour over to the United States? Um, I think they'll go absolutely berserk with delight. <laughs> I really do. I just think American audiences, I think, are just going to go completely crazy. Now, I understand um, that you're quite a private person also, and um, that maybe the real Roger Waters might have been in the back of uh, the wall with Pink Floyd, but now you're going out and you're playing solo. And what, how do you feel about that? Do you feel Wonderful. different? Wonderful. I've been great about it. Do you miss the bandmates? Do you miss...? No. Not at all. Um, when you walk out on stage, uh, a lot of the people that have gone to the shows are Pink Floyd fans. How do you find that they're reacting 
to you. Well, no, we've, only done, well we've, we've only done... The, oh, they're not buying tickets. Well, they are in New York, actually. New York's the only town in the world where they've bought tickets. Bless them. Which is great. Everywhere else, they're not buying tickets at all. I mean, these shows here are actually sold out. But, God, it's been a struggle. It's been terrible. That's why I'm, I've started doing odd little bits of, you know, things like this. Because uh, I suddenly the realisation has come home to me that nobody made any of, any connections between me and those old Pink Floyd shows. Otherwise, they'd be buying tickets for this. And from what I understand also, too, this particular um, show is one of your most expensive productions. It is terribly expensive, yeah. yeah. Are you finding that you're feeling pressure from the promoters, the business people, um, etc., you know, to make money from this tour? No, no, they're making money. I'm the one who's losing all the money. Nobody, you know, I'm, I'm the one who's underwriting it. But in a way, I just, I don't know, I have a feeling it was something that I, I wanted to do and that I needed to do. So if in the end I lose some money, I lose some money. I've made a lot of money out of rock and roll. If I lose some doing it, so what? You seem to be doing more of an elaborate production now, with, given the fact that you're getting more money. And uh, I, I'm given that fact that you're getting more money and more technology. Do you find that uh, that makes you more creative? I'm getting more money. What do you mean? Yeah, well, with the success and all that, that maybe you're making a little bit more money and you're able oh. to use that for technology, oh. in other words. Uh, the technology doesn't interest me in the slightest. I'm completely disinterested in all matters technical. I've never been interested in technique. What I'm interested in is, is, is making something happen that moves people, you know. I want to give people chills up their spine. That's all I'm interested in. I want to give myself chills up the spine, like when I, I can run the stuff and go out and watch it from the hall or listen to it all thing. That, that's, that's all I'm interested in doing. What do you enjoy most so far about the solo tour? Um, it's only just started. We've only been, yeah, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's, It's very relaxed. I mean, it's not. Everybody's... I, that sounds a stupid thing to say because, of course, everybody's wired, completely wired because at any moment it can all collapse. But it's... Uh, there's a good feeling developing in the band and in the crew, although everybody's pretty shattered, particularly in the crew. The crew. There's a lot of walking wounded out there. Already, but it just... Oh, the... the, the you know, you... I mean, the work for us is hard, but for them it's unbe unbelievable. To put this to, you know, drive from Stockholm to Rotterdam and, and then put that up when you arrive is unbelievably hard work. Because they're ironing bugs out of it all the time, you know. And d you, the effects truss only has to be 18 inches out in one direction or another, and that's... and it doesn't work. So then there's a terrible panic to get it in the right place. And you're moving something that weighs several tons about, you know, so it's, it's difficult. What are you looking forward to most going to the United States? The States? Um, just the shows, assuming we've got it right by then. I think the shows will be really enjoyable for all of us. I understand also that the making of the film, The Wall, wasn't quite... No, Mark. How are you? Great. Hi. 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 Andy Newmark. Sorry, carry on. That's all right, Andy. Okay. See you later. You, you want to talk about that as well? Yeah. Okay. Just what it's like down here, uh, okay. in the van, and how much fun it is. <laughs> okay. So why don't we do that, maybe that one first, and then fill okay. in. Ready, John? We've got speed. Anytime. Okay. okay, so what's it like talking with Eric Clapton? That's great. Yeah, how did you get together with him? I rang him up and said, I'm making this album. Would you be interested in, in playing guitar? And he said, well, yeah. I'd like to come and hear it. So I played him the demo I'd made, and he liked it, and that was that. Is he an old friend of yours? No. I mean, I knew him, you know, if, if we passed backstage, we'd go, oh, all right, yeah. 
but we were never, never friendly. You know. How much of an input does he have into the music? Um, well, he gives it that. He, he puts his guitar playing into the music. That's what he puts into it, you know, which is quite different from anybody else's in the world. He, uh, I mean, when he came in to make the record, he very much said, look, you know, um, you just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll try and do it, you know, and if I can't, let's leave it out and not bother with it. I think he thought I was going to try and get him play outside styles that he was used to playing in, but I didn't want him to. I, I wanted him to play with that pure intonation and feeling, which he does better than anybody else. And, uh, and, and he did. And he what? What did he do? He, oh yeah, he would suggest instruments as well. Like, for instance, on the album at the end of side one, there's a dobro s solo, and that goes into side two as well. But she was just listening to it one day and said, why don't I play dobro? And I said, great, bring it in. So there's that kind of input as well, which is terrific. But he's been a tower of strength, you know, just he's, he's been very um, supportive of the whole thing. Because it's, it's been difficult for me, particularly putting the show together. Because while we've been rehearsing the band, you know, I've been having to do all the movie and everything as well. I've been in the car and, and, I've, and he's been extremely supportive. It's been great, wonderful. <laughs> I understand that, that um, the making of the wall wasn't really a very happy experience for you. Now, uh, is that true, first of all? Yeah, this is an area I don't want to go into. I'll tell you why. I've done a long, long, long interview with a great friend of mine called Jim Ladd, who is trying to sell it at the moment. And I, I, so I just want okay. to stick to this stuff, which is something that I've never no, discussed no, no, no. with him. Yeah. And, and the war movie and sex and drugs and religion okay. and nuclear war and Ronald Reagan and all that. I've That's done, fine. I did five hours with this guy and it's there if anybody wants to That's know about fine. it. He's got it. That's okay. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. Good. Great. I'll do it. Thank you for it. Anyway.